Whatever I face, whatever the fear, whatever the cost, you always draw near. Whatever the pain, whatever may come, whatever may fall, your love overcomes. Your love overcomes. I will call, I will call upon you. Whatever I face, you are with me. I will fall, I will fall on my knees. For every heartbreak, you will hold me. You will hold me. Whatever I face, whatever the fear, whatever the cost, you always draw near. Whatever the pain, whatever may come, whatever may fall, your love overcomes. Your love overcomes. I will call, I will call upon you. Whatever I face, you are with me. I will fall, I will fall on my knees. For every heartbreak, you will hold me. You will hold me. Every wall will break, all the darkness shake, all the joy will be renewed. So every needless bow, raise a victory shout, for the King will make things new. Every mountain moved, every light be loose, for your banner will lift in high. Neither death nor height, nor any life could ever cast your love aside. Every wall will break, all the darkness shake, all the joy will be I will call, I will call upon you, whatever I face, you are with me. I will fall, I will fall on my knees, for every heartbreak you will hold me. Whatever I face, whatever the fear, whatever the cost, you always draw near, whatever the pain, whatever may Your love overcomes. Whatever may fall, your love overcomes. Whatever may fall, you will hold me. I keep fighting voices in my mind say I'm not enough every single lie that tells me I will never pass you am I more than just a summer
you. You've been my shield. You've been my defender on the battlefield. You've been my father. You've been my rock. You've been my portion. And you're more than enough. You've been my shelter. You've been my strength. You've been you, but they all pale in comparison to who you really are. All of the words that our, that our brain tries to transfer how our heart is truly feeling about you. that are describing our love for you. Our heart that beats for you. Our heart that is turned towards you because your heart was first turned towards us.
you are all of those things to us. And as incapable as we are to be able to describe the vastness of you, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word chose become, to become flesh. Jesus, because you are the Word, you know exactly what our heart needs to hear. Do you know exactly how to speak to our hearts to know that we are accepted so we understand who we are in you? You being that perfect Word knows perfectly how to bring peace into this troubled world, into our hearts. Jesus, there's so many examples in scriptures that you describe us as friends. Hebrews 2.11 says that you're not ashamed to call us brothers. God, that just blows me away, that just is beyond my comprehension. That you love us that deeply. That you're so enamored by us. That we're not just a friend, we're a brother. That, that brother doesn't just describe a, a relationship or a family member. Church, in the Greek, that word describes a blood relative. Jesus, I thank you that you have brought us back into the family of God through your blood, that we're not just a friend, that we're not just a relative. But you are not ashamed to call us your brother. that our DNA literally has been transformed back into the DNA of how God designed and purposed us to be. That in each one of us, we have the, the DNA of Jesus. Jesus, we love you. And even though our, our words fail us, in being able to describe how enamored we are in what you are in our lives. Here are our hearts that beat for you. Because we worship and we adore you. Church, if that is your heart cry this morning, give a big shout out, amen. Amen. What a beautiful thought, right? It just blows me away. You know, it's easy to say that we're in the family of God, but when you think about what that truly means for each one of us, words just can't describe it, right? I'm so thankful to be in the family of God, are you? I'm so thankful that we're here together as a family as well. Really, we don't, we have to be very careful to use, that we're not using that word family lightly. It's a big word. That's an important word for us as believers, especially in this particular body, to say that we're all part of the same family. You know, the world is continually looking to find out where they come from and who they are, right? That's why you have ancestry DNA and all of those kind of things because they want to know where their origin is from. <coughs> if, you're, if you're part of the family of Christ, we know where we come from and we're all part of that same family. It doesn't mean that we don't argue and we don't bicker sometimes, that we don't have disagreements. But if we truly, truly believe that we are part of the family of God and part of this family, we're going to look past all of our, our own idiosyncrasies and our own disagreements 
in the way we think about things differently. And we're going to come back to that one common denominator. We're all brothers and sisters through the blood of Jesus Christ. He's not ashamed of that, and neither should we be. Amen? That is huge, huge news for us this morning, church. And if this is your first time, I want to welcome you into this family. We're not a perfect family, but we're striving to be more like Jesus Christ because he sets the example for us. And as we grow together with each other in him, our family draws, draws closer together. Amen? Well, we're excited to have you here this morning. We have some announcements on some upcoming events for you, and uh, we're just happy to have you. Good morning, I am Destiny Inglehart, and on behalf of Redeeming Love Christian Embassy, we welcome and thank you for spending part of your weekend here with us. RLCE is dedicated to be a wise church through worship, instruction, service, and evangelism, and we are focused on loving God and people. If you are a first-time guest or just tuning in, we would like to connect with you. We know everyone prefers different methods of communication, so we offer a few. You can text WELCOME to the number 989 625-9300 or you can scan the QR code with your cell phone to fill our online welcome card or you can simply fill out the welcome card at the hospitality table in the foyer. We have some gifts waiting for you. Now here's some announcements to help us all stay connected. The Embassy has moved to a new text platform. If you would like to continue receiving updates on events, text UPDATE to the number 989-625-9300. Once you receive a text, reply yes to confirm. It's that easy. So make sure to do it today and stay informed. Apostle Nate Blouse will be ministering next Sunday, May 29th during the 10 a.m. worship service. Two hour ministry sessions for $130 with Nate are being scheduled by Pastor Darlene for Saturday and Sunday afternoon. Call 989-798-6543. If you booked a session with Apostle Nate, please visit his website at inthesafeplace.com. Click prayer sessions and watch the intro video. Remember, healing can begin where safety is realized. Would you like to connect and get to know others? Great, RLCE has a life group for you. The College and Career class is meeting each Thursday at Pastor Darlene's home located at 5572 West Spring Knoll Drive at 7 o'clock p.m. The Joy Club for ages 55 and up will be meeting each Friday at Pastor Darlene's home at 6 o'clock p.m. Each Wednesday, Therese Long will lead a group at her home located at 609 North Lynn Street at 6 o'clock p.m. Embassy Student Ministries Life Group for grades 6 through 12 will meet each Sunday at 6.30 p.m. through 8 o'clock p.m. at the home of Melissa Cornelius located at 4566 Greenfield Drive, Bay City. Come gather with your friends and make new ones. We will be honoring our graduates on Sunday, June 5th during the 10 a.m. service. Graduates, please wear your cap and gown or black dress clothes. A punch reception will follow the service. Celebrate Dad this Father's Day at the Embassy on Sunday, June 19th during the 10 a.m. service. Drawings and giveaways will occur, so mark it in your calendar and invite Dad today. We are working towards our next quarterly goal of $780,000 for the building fund. Here are a few convenient ways to give. Scan this QR code from your cell phone or text GIVE to the number 989-625-9300 or place your gift in the envelope, mark building on it, and mail it to 3012 East Midland Road, Bay City, Michigan, 48706. You can renew your pledge, make a new pledge, or help us with fundraisers. Make sure to like us on Facebook and share as many of our posts as possible. Have you picked up your RLCE mug? It's great for coffee, tea, or even hot chocolate for those cool summer evenings. Pick yours up today in the foyer for a donation of $5 or more. Proceeds benefit our outreach programs and the building fund. Normally our children would head next door to the Secure United Way Family Center for Embassy Kids. However, due to unforeseen circumstances, they will gather at the door right of the stage and into a secure area outside for their lesson and fun activities, if it's not raining, that is. We should be back to our normal schedule soon. The nursery is open for children ages 3 and under on the mezzanine each Sunday except the first of Sunday of each month. Those designed to give your tithes and offerings may do so at this time with containers located to the left and to the right of the stage or by texting GIVE to the number 989-625-9300 or simply scan this QR code with your cell phone. 
Thank you for moving God's kingdom forward. Please feel free to take a moment to greet one another. Our next announcements will resume shortly. This world can be cold and bitter it feels like we're in the dead of winter Waiting on something better But am I really gonna hide forever? Over and over again I hear your voice in my head Let your light shine, let your light shine For all to see, start a fire In my soul, fan the flame Make it grow Please welcome Apostle Jeff as he comes to continue our series on the great questions of life. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. As you're making your way back to your seat quickly, and <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. No one can say you're an unfriendly church, right? And that's, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. We're so glad that you're here this morning, and for those that have tuned in, and, and uh, hopefully our cameras are working just fine today. And, you know, when I, when I married Denise, um, yeah, woo, <laughs> I married an upgrade. Anyhow, but when I married Denise, I, there was a tradition that, that her family would, would do, um, you know, her and I we, and the kids, we'd all go to the Thanksgiving Day outreach and, and uh, serve up meals and deliver meals, and, and um, many of you do that same thing. But after that, we would get in the car. We'd already have the car packed. We'd get in the car and we'd leave right from wherever we were serving the meals from, and we'd drive up past Oscoda to Harrisville, Michigan, and we would see my father-in-law, and we'd spend we'd spend two days with them, and we'd spend Thanksgiving with them, and then the next day. And there's not a whole lot to do in Harrisville, Michigan, and uh, but while we were up there, we would always put together. They'd always have these puzzles. They'd buy a puzzle, a new puzzle, and I'm not a puzzle person. I know that shocks you, doesn't it? But anyhow, um, but when there's nothing else to do, guess what you do? You put together a puzzle, don't you? And we would put together like a thousand piece puzzle and I can't tell you how many times we tried to fit the wrong piece in the wrong spot just to be done with the puzzle. Has anyone else done that? Yeah, I got scissors out one time. They said, what are you gonna do with that? I says, well, <laughs> we're gonna make it fit. No, um, but, you know, how many know that God designed each of you uniquely? That each one of you are a puzzle piece in this master life 
and the master plan of God. And that without you, the plan is incomplete. Without you, and without you doing what you've been purposed to do, you're that missing puzzle piece in the puzzle. God has designed each one of us differently and uniquely, put his print and his stamp on every one of us uniquely. And he needs each one of us to fulfill our purpose in life. Well, today we're going to talk just about that. We're going to talk about purpose. And several of you have read The Purpose Driven Life by Pastor Rick Warren. It was out, um, my goodness, it's been probably 20 years ago now. But it's just a great book. And so we know that from his book, he says that we've all been called. There's five purposes that we were created for God to fulfill. First of all was our worship to God. Unselfish fellowship with one another and him. Spiritual maturity your ministry or your calling, that's your purpose, and your mission. What was I designed for? What am I going to accomplish in my life? But um, I, I, like, I like one of the quotes that, that he, he said, you were put here on earth. Well, that's, that's a good one too. Uh, you were made by God and for God, and until you understand that, life will never make sense. You know, I think all of us, sometime in our life, we say, what what on earth am I here for, right? What is God's plan for my life? What's my purpose for my life? And uh, we're going to talk about that today. Number one, we're just going to do it. We're going to do a quick review. A few weeks ago, we did. We spoke on knowing your identity. Because if you know your identity, you know where you came from, right? And identity, it's, it's so if you're make, filling out your notes, you want to put in their identity. So God created mankind in his own image, in his own In his image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them, according to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. You have God's divine nature attributes. You have his DNA in your bodies. The Bible says he he knows your ending from your beginning. In Isaiah chapter 46, verse 10, it says this, I know the plans. It says, I have known the end from the beginning, from the ancient times when it was still to come. I say my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. You see, God knows our ending from our beginning. And then in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, it says this, Before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you and purposed you. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. And he knows the plans and the purposes for your life, according to Jeremiah 29, 11. So you ask, why on earth am I here? Then that moves us to the next part, and that's purpose. Purpose is determined by God since he's the creator. Isn't that right? If someone is working on a beautiful uh, pot of of clay, uh, I've I've seen different artisans work on pots and make pottery. And as they're making it, the way they move their hands and the tool that they're using with the pottery as the pottery wheel is going around determines on every outcome of that piece of pottery, how it's going to, how it's going to turn out, how it's going to look, how it's going to um, make an invaluable difference for someone. That's exactly what we are. The Bible says that we're all clay, that we've been made from clay, that God, he's the potter and we're the clay. So, Purpose is determined by by God. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purposes that prevail. Many times we can feel like we're we're going off and doing our own thing, what we want to do, and many times we'll be then turned back to do his will because he has a purpose for your life. Then I think of uh, number three. Purpose is determined before it's discovered. Your purpose was already determined before you discovered it. Think about that. Some of us go through, you know, our 20s, our 30s, we get to our 40s, and we're still wrestling with the whole, what's my purpose thing? I'm tired of doing the same thing over and over again. What is my purpose? What's my purpose? And the Bible says that in your doing, you're actually going to come to the realization of what God purposed for your life. Sometimes people give their life to Christ at a much older age. They give their life to Christ in their 60s, 70s, 80s. I remember having at the hospital one time and speaking to a 92-year-old man, and he gave his life to Christ in that hospital room. And I thought, how amazing that God allowed him to live that long and finally 
before the end of his life, still give his life to Christ? Huh? Your purpose is determined before it's discovered. Because God works through your faults, your failures, your successes. God determines it, but you must discover it. That's why Jeremiah 29 and 11 says, I know the plans I have for you. It goes on to say plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. That means that God is already in your future. He's already planned it out. He's already waiting for you to catch up to him. He's already planned things for your life. Now, he knows that pitfalls are going to come because guess what? We don't always make the best choices, do we? We don't always follow his leading of his spirit, do we? And if you don't know his spirit, you can't follow his, the leading of his spirit. And so there's messes that we make in our own lives. And yet God still takes those things once we give our life to him. He takes the, the mess that we created, all those things around us. I mean, he takes the good, he takes the success, he takes the broken relationships, the good relationships. He takes the skills, the mistakes, the wrong choice, the failures. He takes the love, he takes talents, giftings, and he blends them all together and says, you know what, I'm going to take all these things and I'm going to use it all together for your good anyhow. And I'm going to put it into your purpose. That's why I love to hear when Teen Challenge comes and they give their testimonies about God's goodness in their life. How they lost everything. They lost their kids. They lost their family. They lost everything because of, of, of drugs or alcohol or whatever. And all of a sudden, they, get, they, get, they give their life to Christ. And he makes a clean change. He makes a difference in their life. And then all of a sudden, they start getting all these things start coming back. Because he restores, the Bible says, he restores what the canker worm was meant to take away. God always restores. He's a restorer. God already knew all the things, just like a puzzle piece that he puts together your purpose. The patterns of this world are always fighting against God's purpose. Romans chapter 12, 2 says this, Do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. God's will is his purpose and his purpose for your life. The world system always goes after your potential. I want you to think about that for a moment. The world system always goes after your potential. They see your gifts, talents, and abilities, and they always go after that. They want your potential. Well, you're good at this. We want to hire you. And not only do we want to hire you, but we want to bring you in to do this very thing. And we want you to be a slave to this one thing over and over and over and over and over and over again. The world's always after potential. Matter of fact, they'll pay for your potential. They'll give you raises based on your potential, on your gifts, your talents, your abilities. They'll, they'll, they'll give you those raises. You can, you, you can succeed on potential. Potential is everything you could do. Listen to this now. Potential is everything you could do, but purpose is what you have been graced to do. Did that sink in a little bit? You see, I have lots of potential. I can do lots of things, believe it or not. I can do lots of things. And I could get far on my, on, on my potential. But God says, but Jeff, there's something I've, been, I've purposed you to do. And I've given you a grace to do it. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy. But I've given you a grace to do it. And I've empowered you to do it. And I want you to do it. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm not comfortable there. I'm not comfortable in, in that. And he says, but I've graced you to do it. You see, sometimes God moves you into the uncomfortable because he's trying to pull out the purpose that's within you, that he designed in you, that he created in you. So he'll move you sometimes into those arenas of the uncomfortable to pull out the spectacular, the very purpose of his being in you. I, you know, I think of this too. Everyone wants to use the scripture, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But did you know what? Only the people that are willing to move past their potential and into the God-graced purpose, that's the scripture for them. That's the scripture they get to claim. Those ones that God is moving you from the, the potential that you have, you know you can do this. But then he moves you into an arena and you're like, I don't know if I can do that. And it's like, I graced you to do that. 
you can do it. And he moves you into this arena that you've been graced to do. And that's where the Apostle Paul found himself. And he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So many people get calling confused with doing. They get their purpose caught up with their, with their, their potential. But God calls us human beings. He doesn't call us human doings. Isn't that right? He calls us human beings, not human doings. Because God is more, he's, he's more concerned about you being than he is concerned about you doing. That's why he says, you know what? It's not by works you're going to get anywhere. It's not by works that you're going to be saved. Because there's not enough money, there's not enough things you can do to receive the grace that I've given you. How many know you can't? pay for a gift that's been given. Isn't that right? And if the person asks you for reimbursement, it ain't a gift. (laughs) Right? If you've got to pay for something or if you've got to do something in return for the gift that you received, it really wasn't a gift. Was it? No. God uses calling to reveal your purpose and your purpose is about you becoming what God wants you to become. And many times it's revealed through your very doing, the very things you're doing, God all of a sudden starts revealing your purpose. You know, you've heard me say it before, it's sometimes, sometimes God is hewing out things, and don't tell me wrong, he, he'll use your skills, he'll use your talents, your abilities. But many times he'll use those things, that the things that you're doing after work. You know what I'm talking about. You go to work because you need, you need a check, to put on your table. You need to put food on your table, right? But it's those things in the evening that you come home to do, those hobbies, those interests, those passions that you have. Those passions many times is the very purpose that God is working out in your life. Sometimes God will move you into a position that your potential got you there, and then all of a sudden you, you, get, you get more put on you, you get more placed on you, and you're feeling stretched at work. Huh? Or you're feeling stretched even at home with with the things that are going on in your family or around you. And God is saying, you know what? I'm not going to give you more than you can bear. But in the midst of it, I'm going to cause that stretching because I want to pull that purpose out of your life. I want to pull that purpose out of your life. God has a purpose for your life. God uses calling to reveal your purpose. Let me say this, be careful of the enemy will twist your season to think that your value is in what you're doing instead of what you're becoming. Do you know what I'm talking about? We're in church, hear the church bells. But think about that for a moment. Be careful because the enemy will twist your season to think that your value is in what you're doing instead of what you're becoming. I see this all the time. I lost, Apostle Jeff, I lost my job. What are we going to do now? What am I going to do now? I, and I says, you know what? Your job didn't define who you are. Your job doesn't define who you are. Your job doesn't define whose you are. Jesus said, I'm your provider. I'm the good shepherd. That doesn't mean that you quit your job and just say, okay, Jesus, provide for me. Because he says he blesses the work of your hands. Isn't that right? And if you ain't working, you shouldn't be eating. That's what his his word says. That's pretty, pretty strong, isn't it? It is. But be careful, because when your potential gets you to a place, and everything is operating really smoothly because your potential has the ability to make it run smoothly, and everything is all good, and everything is fanfare and wonderful, all of a sudden you think... That this is the season. This is the season. And all of a sudden, you get wrapped up in your doing rather than your becoming. Yet we get anxious because we're doing so much. And when God calls you to do something, he's calling you to a place so you can become. Be not anxious. I'm going to say it like this. Be not anxious in well-doing. You're like, is that a scripture? That's two put together. Let me give them to you. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7 says this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ. 
Anytime you're feeling anxiety, anytime you're feeling anxious, I want you to know that anxiety is actually a God-given trigger to say, something's wrong and I need to face it. Something's wrong, I need to deal with it. Not medicate it, but deal with it. What, what is that trigger in my life that's causing me anxiety? And God, how do you want me to face it? How do you want me to deal with it? And then all of a sudden, God reveals to you what it is so you can deal with it. So that way, your heart is guarded. Your understanding is trans- he transcends your understanding. And your mind is sharp in Christ Jesus. Anxiety always causes you to be weary. If you're wondering why you're weary, if you're tired... Somewhere there's anxiety happening in your life. What's causing you to be tired and weary? What, where's that, what, what's causing that anxiety in your life? Pinpoint it. Pinpoint it and say, you know what? i got to change this. And you begin to change it. I'm resigning tomorrow. No, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but, you know, Galatians chapter 6, 9 says this. It says, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. If we faint not, turn to the person next to you or in front of you, behind you, say, you know what? You're going to reap a harvest. Come on, declare it to them. You're going to reap a harvest. Tell them, keep going. Keep going. Keep moving forward. You're going to reap a harvest. Keep moving. Keep going forward. You're going to get that promotion. Keep moving. Keep going forward. God's going to open the right door at the right season in your life. Keep moving. Keep pushing. Keep going forward. God is going to do and work out his good pleasure in your life, and he's going to see your purposes be revealed. Number four is this. God reveals your purpose. It's God that reveals your purpose. Ephesians chapter 2.10 says, For we are God's handiwork. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's why I know that God shows us our purpose. Because he's already got works for you to do that's in the future. I I heard a long time ago, Prophet Kim Clement said, you're somewhere in the future and you look much better than you look right now. You're somewhere in the future and you look much better than you look right now. It's because you are moving from this time right now that you're at here and you're moving forward into the future and you're becoming all that God has for you and your purpose is being realized and your purpose is being stretched and your purpose is being called out and you can be in your 80s and see your purpose still come come to being that's the amazing thing about jesus and what he does in our lives that's the amazing thing about the holy spirit amen god reveals your purposes jeremiah 1 5 i said it before before you were in your mother's womb i knew you before you were born i set you apart that wasn't just for jeremiah that was for all of us Before you were placed in your mother's womb, God knew you. You were a seed thought in the Father's mind before time ever began. That, to me, just amazes me. And to think that he's already thought about you and he's thought about me. And he's, you know what? I'm going to cross their path someday. They're going to spur each other on in faith. That, to me, is amazing to me. He reveals his corporate purpose Mark chapter 16, 15, this is our corporate purpose. This is for every believer. It says this. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. That's your job and my job. Do you know how we preach the good news of the gospel? You know how we do that? We say, you know what? This is what God has done for me. This is what Jesus has done in my life. Everybody likes to listen to a story. They don't want to hear a scripture quoted to them. They want to hear your story. They want to hear about your encounter with with a powerful God that did something in your life. And that gives you the passion in your life to say, this is what God did in my life. And if he's done this in my life, he can do it in your life. Matter of fact, his word says it will. He's not a respecter of persons. Well, I'm glad someone's getting a little excited out there. Thank you so much. (laughs) <laughs> mm. he reveals that corporate purpose to us because he wants us to do something it is our responsibility as a church to fill every one of these seats 
And if we had to do it two and three times on a Sunday, I'd stand up here and speak two and three times on a Sunday because it's our corporate responsibility to tell a region about Jesus Christ. That's our responsibility. Our responsibility. Sometimes he reveals his purpose, but when we run from it because we don't think we could achieve it or we just don't want or we just don't want the anxiety that sometimes it tries to bring us, or we don't want that purpose. We think we're designed for something else. (laughs) I used to think I was designed for something else too. And God said, no, that's not what I want you to do. I want you to do this. Well, no, I already seen that. I grew up with that. I was like, I don't want that. Even though my parents were were wonderful pastors, and they were who they said they were on Sunday morning. They were the same people in the house all week long. There was none of this, you know, two-faced business going on. They were as real on Sunday as they were at home. And I saw my dad got on, get on some parishioners sometimes, just like he got on my brother and I, and I said, yeah, he loves them. He loves them. I don't know about you, but I want to have people in my life that I'm in relationship with that care enough about me to get on me and say, hey, what are you doing? Right? His big words, hot dog, you hot dog, what are you doing? Hot dog. <laughs> Just ask Landon. We were, <laughs> they were on, they were, uh, I was flying to meet them one time. They had gone ahead because I had to stay back for some meetings and a funeral, and um, so they, they went on vacation without me, and I, I met up with them. And Landon says, Dad, Papa drives like a wild man. And you know what? He, you know what he says? He, he, he's so funny. People pull out in front of him. He says, oh, you hot dog. Where'd you get your license? Cracker Jack box? You know, he says, he talks to the drivers, and Dad, they can't hear him. <laughs> I said, oh, you should have seen Papa when I was younger. God's really sanctifying him. Amen. He used to have road rage. Eh? <laughs> but 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 5 and 7, it says this. There are different kinds of gifts. There's different kinds of puzzle pieces. If you've been puzzled with somebody in this room, good. They're a puzzle piece. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all... Ma- them in everyone it is the same God at work in them now to each one that manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good the manifestation of the Holy Spirit alive and powerful in your life will work out the good in your life and it'll all be think about it we'll walk in goodness Surely goodness and mercy will follow them all the days of their life. Goodness is just going to overflow out of an abundance of the Spirit of God that's within us. He says this, now to each one of the manifestations of the Spirit is given for the common good. Verse 11 says this, and these are the work of one and the same Spirit. He distributes them to each one just as he determines. One translation I read, it said, just as he purposed. I like that, just as he purposed. Remember, when you run from God's purpose, you're really running from the presence of God. And when you're going, and where you can go where he, and where can you go where he's not already there? I mean, think about it. The Bible says he's omnipresent everywhere at once. Let me fill you in on a secret. The devil's not. He's not omnipresent He's walking around with a crushed in head because the Bible says that, that Jesus' heel crushed the serpent's head. So the only, the, only, the only power the enemy has in your life is the power you give him. The open doors that you allow in your life. The wrong movies, the wrong pictures. You know what I'm saying? The wrong chemicals into your body. The wrong things that you allow in your, in your body. The lies that he can tell you if you can believe a lie. Guess what? You gave him place. And the Apostle Paul says, give no place to the enemy. He's talking about don't believe the lies of the enemy. The enemy can't stop you from doing your purpose. He can't be everywhere at once. Long time ago, I learned, you know what? I'm not all that special. That the enemy is going to be there with me all the time. So I must be making a lot of stupid mistakes. Huh? Come on, now let's own up to it. Isn't that right? 
I'm going to give you permission this one time to look at the person next to you or text them right now, and they'll, under, they'll understand what you're talking about, but yes, I, I, I forgive you for your stupid mistakes. That's okay. Because all of us make stupid mistakes. There's not one perfect person in this room. Nor are you watching at home in your bathrobe and underwear. You know what I'm talking about. Huh? So, I don't know where that came from, but anyhow. Holy, the Holy Spirit. Now he's, now he's airing our laundry. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Remember Jonah. Remember the story of Jonah in the Bible. Jonah was a prophet. God called this prophet, Jonah, to go to Nineveh to speak to a nation so the nation would all turn to God. Jonah said, they're a wicked, evil nation. I don't want to do it. God says, I want you to do it anyhow. And he says, I ain't doing it. So he gets on a boat going the wrong direction. Going the wrong direction. Well, there was a storm that happened. A really bad storm. And they started throwing stuff over the boat to try so the boat didn't sink. They, I mean, they, they started taking the goods that the captain was sailing with to take from one port to the next. And all of a sudden, Jonah came up and said, you know what? Stop throwing things out of the boat. It's me. Throw me out of the boat. I'm the cause of this mess. <laughs> they picked his little sorry butt up and threw him overboard. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they threw him out of the boat. Now, the Bible doesn't say a whale swallowed Jonah. I don't know where people ever got that story. The Bible doesn't say a whale swallowed Jonah. It said a great fish. Now, whatever that great fish is, I mean, we think of whales, but hey, whatever that is. And it says that he was actually in Sheol, which is, which is another word for hell, for three days, right? And while he was there, he started repenting. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I think I'd be doing that too. I'd have started when I was on the boat, don't throw me off. Just let, let's repent. Let's turn the boat around. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, but all of a sudden, he started repenting, and he started saying, God, all right, I'll, I'll do what you want me to do. I'll, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll go to the uncomfortable. I'll go to those that I don't love. I'll go to those that I don't really like. I'll go to those that I have a prejudice against. Oh, somebody need to hear that right now. God will send you to this person that you might be prejudiced against because God's not prejudiced. And all of a sudden, of course, you know, this great fish spits him out, and guess where he's at? Nineveh. That's the story. He's at Nineveh. So he walks around looking like, oh, my word, from, I can't imagine from acids or whatever. I mean, he must have been a sight for sore eyes. Walking around declaring, God's going to destroy your nation unless you repent. That's all he said. He kept walking around their whole, their whole the whole island, the whole nation. God's going to destroy you unless you repent. God's going to destroy you unless you repent. God's going to destroy you unless you repent. Repent, God's going to destroy you. I hope he burns your butt. He's going to destroy it. You know what I mean? He's just getting all, he's getting all real excited. You know what I mean? And he keeps declaring this and declaring it. Well, the king said, what? And the king tore his clothes, put sackcloth and ashes on, and told the whole country, we're going to repent. Oh, to have a king like that. Oh, to have a king like that. Oh, to have a president sometime in office that says, we're going to repent as a nation. To repent as a nation. God, give us a president like that that says, we're going to repent as a nation. And they put sackcloth and ashes on and they repented. And God's wrath turned from them and his blessing came to them. What would have happened if Jonah's purpose would have never been fulfilled? Would the whole nation been destroyed because of one man's lack of understanding of his purpose and the power that he was the power that he was carrying within him? Because back in the Old Testament, only the prophets had the Spirit of God in them. And because he gave them a gift, they could misuse that gift. That's why when you're reading the Old Testament and it says terrible things were happening, and these prophets are saying, God's saying this, God didn't say that. God didn't say smash the babies against the rocks. It was these prophets that are looking through things through a filter in their mind and they're misusing their gift that God gave them. Now, before you get too judgmental, think about how you're misusing the gifts God gave you. What? Aren't you talking about them Baptists down the road? No, I'm talking about us right here. I'm talking about all of us because we're human. Sometimes we misuse the gifts that God gave us. 
And that's not what he intended for your purpose to look like or to be. Number five is this. Don't try living someone else's purpose. Don't try imitating somebody else. I will never be my dad, and I will never be my brother. As probably hard as I tried. I'm just not them. I'm somebody else. Every person has a unique gift, a design with with a, a unique gift and an ability. God wants to use that. He wants to use that for your purpose. Don't try living out someone else's purpose. Galatians 2 9 says this James and Cephas, Cephas is Simon Peter, by the way, if you're wondering where, what Cephas is about, that's Simon Peter. And John and the, those esteemed as pillars gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. This is the Apostle Paul talking. Gave us the right hand of fellowship. When they recognized the grace given to me, they agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they should go to the circumcised Jews. If you see circumcised in the Bible, that means they were Jews. And that's exactly what ended up happening. James, Peter, and John ministered along even with Matthew to those that were in the Jewish faith, the Jewish culture. They were raised in that culture, and that's where they ministered. Paul was also raised as a great lawyer in that, but God graced him for a different purpose. It was to go to the Gentiles, to us, and speak of the good news of the gospel and the grace that God has for us. They recognized the grace that was on each other's lives, and because they recognized each other's grace... They didn't want to copy each other. They wanted to become who God purposed them to become. Just because someone isn't doing exactly what you think they should do, maybe they shouldn't be. Maybe God's graced them in a different way with a different purpose to show forth the purposes of God. Now, there's things we get to do corporately, which, you know, man, if you missed, if you missed Friday night, uh, prayer and, and worship service at the Marriott Hotel, you missed a good time. It was fantastic. It was really good. And honestly, by the second hour, it was just getting started and we had to shut it down because we, we had to rent the space. And so um, I was like, man, we just needed, we just needed one more hour because we were right there and things started happening. I mean, there were some words of knowledge that had happened that night. We, there were some praying for prayers for healing that happened that night. There was a prophetic word that came forward. I mean, it was just really... It was just a good night. Good night. Hopefully you'll make the next one, right? Hopefully you've got it free on your calendar. You can make the next one. Plus, we also heard about some exciting building plans. And, um, but you weren't there, so I can't tell you about that. Anyhow, um, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just teasing. I'm teasing. Um, so don't try living in someone else's purpose, according to Galatians 2.9. If we compare ourselves to others, we will never be able to achieve our own purpose. Remember, when, you're, when you covet someone else's purpose, it hinders you from fulfilling yours. Never want what somebody else has. God has something designed specifically, uniquely, just for you. And if they're not thinking or acting like you, if other people around you aren't thinking or acting like you, stop it. They're not you. That's something I had to learn, too. What? What? They don't want to become like me? No, they don't. They don't want to gain weight. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) They want to live healthy and happy lives. You know what I mean? Uh, But really think about that. If you are taking somebody else's purpose, if you're wanting somebody else's purpose, guess what? You're hindering your own purpose from being manifested in your life. Don't try living someone else's purpose. Number six is this. Stop comparing your purpose to someone else's purpose. So don't live someone else's purpose, but don't compare your purpose to someone else's purpose, right? 1 Corinthians 12, 17 through 18 says this, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. You cannot fulfill your purpose on your own You need the Holy Spirit. I need the Holy Spirit to fulfill the purpose in my life. Because he's the one that's going to talk to you from God's throne about your design. About your perfect DNA. 
That's where God's going to come and talk to you about. That's where he's going to speak to you at. Luke chapter 10, verse 8 says this. When you enter a town, remember we, we did this in, in the last series we just, we just came from. In um, Luke chapter 10, verse 8, when you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you, heal the sick who are there, and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. It's also in Matthew. Tell them the kingdom of heaven has come near to you. But notice this. Jesus, Jesus sends them out to preach the gospel, and then, he, and then he says, Oh, and by the way, I expect signs and wonders. By the way, I expect you to see healings. I expect healings to manifest because you are my ambassador. I want, you to, I want that to sink in for a moment. Because when we go out and, and, we're, and we're praying for people, if you see something happen for somebody, you don't say, oh, God, would you heal them? Oh, God, would you be with them? Oh, please don't say that in my presence. God's everywhere all at once. He's never going to leave you nor forsake you, the Bible says. So why are you praying for God to be with them? He's already with them. Isn't that right? Say yes, Apostle Jeff. Yes. Just say yes. Yes. Because God's already with them. He's with you 24-7. He knows everything you're involved in, everything you're doing. And he still, every time he looks at you, he still sees Jesus. And he still sees forgiven according to Colossians chapter 3. Even when we're not doing the best, he still forgives us. He still covers us. Make sure that you're praying appropriate prayers. If he says, I'm sending you out to heal the sick... Go study the disciples. How did they heal the sick? One said, silver and gold I have none, but such as I have, I give unto you. Take up your bed and walk. That was a command. That was an authority. So Jesus wants you to go out in his authority. That's for every believer. That's called the believer's authority. Amen? God wants to use you. Some Christians have embraced the burden of the task but not the gift of the Holy Spirit. God might have called you to do something and he's calling you and he's purposing you to do something and you're moving closer into that purpose and that purpose is being manifested along with your gifts, talents, and abilities and all of a sudden, but you're doing it without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and when you're doing it without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, things just aren't manifesting. See, if you go out in the power of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says the Spirit will show you things that are yet to come. So you can say, okay, God, I'm going to work today. What's going to happen? And he can fill you in on your day. Come on. If he says he's going to show you things that are yet to come, then ask him, what's, yet, what's, what, what's on the agenda today? Sometimes he's told me you're going to run into a certain person. And you'll know them because they have, I mean, one time he told me because they have a red scarf on. So I'm all day, I'm looking for a red scarf. You know what I mean? By the end of the day, I got tired of looking for a red scarf, and I stopped, and I'm in the grocery store at Kroger, and all of a sudden, there is a man with a red scarf. And I'm thinking, he's a man, and he's a red scarf. And, uh, and all of a sudden, with confidence, with confidence, I went up to him, and I said, you know what? God has a design and a purpose and a plan for your life. And all of a sudden, he's, he, I started sharing some things that, that the Holy Spirit downloaded to me earlier that day. That was, that was like 24, 25 years ago. And he stood there, and he was, you could tell he was just shaken because he didn't have an encounter with me. He had an encounter with an almighty, loving God that was concerned about him. Huh? See, we need the Holy Spirit in our lives to give us ideas. The Bible says that he empowers you to live. If he's empowering you to live, that means every good and perfect gift is coming down from above. That's what the Bible says. How are they coming here? How are they coming from above? They are coming from the throne room of God, from the throne room of grace, coming through the pipeline of the Holy Spirit into your mind. That's why scientists can, can come up with the brilliant things. That's why doctors can do things. And they say, you know what? I didn't have the training for that, but something told me while I was doing surgery. I've heard that before. I'm like, praise God. That's awesome. Because God wants to use their talents and abilities, but he also wants to give them wisdom that's beyond them. 
That's what God does. He takes the wisdom that we've been given, the wisdom that we've studied, the wisdom that we've gained, and then he also mixes a little bit in, of his own and helps us out even more. After all, it's all his wisdom. Because we're made in his image and in his likeness. But just because you're made in his image and his likeness, you are not God. You are not a little God running around the world. Huh? So watch out for the new age teaching that teaches that you're a God. That your answers are within. <laughs> no. The Bible says in Zechariah 4, 6, it's not by might nor power, but by the spirit of the Lord. One thing I liked about prayer meeting on Friday night during the, during the worship time and the prayer time, Pastor Rick came up and, and said, you know what, I just feel that we're all just supposed to pray in the spirit corporately, that we're all just supposed to stir up the gift that's within us. They know that, that that's what the scripture says, stir up the gift that's within you. And corporately, for, for a, a short period of time, we just all began to pray in the spirit. Now, doing things like that is acceptable because you're coming to a, a believer's service. How many know that? If I did that in an open air meeting where, where we don't know if believers are there, if there's unbelievers there, they wouldn't know what's going on and there'd have to be a, an interpretation of a tongue that would happen. Right? That's order. That's the difference between Romans chapter 8 that says that you've been given the gift of the Spirit, that's your own personal prayer language to speak directly to God, versus Corinthians. First Corinthians talks about that he's given corporate gifts, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, tongues, interpretation. That tongues in Corinthians is actually saying it's a corporate tongue. That's the tongues that was being used on the day of Pentecost when all these different people came from all these different nations from around the world, and they heard the gospel in their own tongue, in their own language. It's because someone was being used in the gift of tongues. It was in the gift of interpretation. They were being used in a language that was already a known language. That's the difference between Romans chapter 8, personal tongues, God's direct channel from you to him, and in Corinthians where it's talking about it's a corporate tongue, meaning it's for everybody. Isn't that cool? It's awesome. Anyhow. Coming to a close, Ephesians chapter 4, it says this, As a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received, the purpose you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. This is what he's telling each one of us to be. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Have you ever had that person that just got on your last nerve? Don't look at them right now. Don't look at them. Don't point them out. <laughs> It, uh, it, it will not go well for you. Anyhow, but you know that person that really gets on your last nerve? Huh? Come on. You've already pictured them in your mind. You've already seen them in your mind. You know exactly what I'm talking about. But yet the Bible says, I want you still to be patient with them, and I want you to be bearing with them one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There's one body, there's one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Say in all. He's in all of us. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it, as he purposed it. This is, this is it. It says this. When he ascended on high, he took the many captives and he gave gifts to his people. He gave gifts. The Holy Spirit has given gifts to each one of us. Each one of us are a puzzle piece in the overall plan, overall plan of God's plan for our lives. Your purpose is not found, if you're taking notes, you're going to want to write this down. Your purpose is not found in what you do, but in God who you know. Your purpose is not found in what you do. It can be discovered through what you do, but it's only going to be found in God who you know. That's why it's so important to develop that daily routine, that daily relationship with the Father. It's so important to get to know who the Father is in your life so you can have that communication and you can commune with the Father so you get to know who the Father is and what the Father is saying to you. It's so vitally important. But you say, God, 
since you created me, what did you design me for? What's my purpose? These are my questions for you this morning. You're going to want to fill in the blank on this. First one is this. In all you're doing, what are you becoming? In all you're doing, what are you becoming? In all you're doing, what are you becoming? The second question I have for you this morning is, I was going to put the word would, and the Holy Spirit says no. (laughs) And I said, will seems kind of strong. He says, yep. Will you sacrifice your potential for God's purpose for your life? Will you sacrifice all the potential that you have, those naturally God-given gifts, talents, and abilities for the purpose that he has for your life. Now, don't take me wrong. He'll use the talents and abilities in your life. But he's saying, I don't want you to depend on your natural gifts that I've given you. I want to stretch you and move you and show you what your purpose is and show you where you exactly fit. Hmm. As the musicians come back to the, to the stage this morning, I want you to just take a minute to ponder that. If, you, if you've got one of the notes, one of the handouts in front of you, I want us all just to think about those two questions this morning for just, just, a, few, just a couple of minutes. In all you're doing, what are you becoming? In my doing, am I becoming a better believer? In my doing, am I becoming more patient? In my doing, am I becoming more loving? Huh? In my doing, am I becoming more free? In my doing, am I becoming more forgiving? In my doing, am I becoming more generous? Because as much as you're doing matters, it matters to God that we're becoming, that we're being, that we're becoming what he's designed us to be, that he's created us to be. And then the second question, will you sacrifice your potential for God's purpose for your life? That's a personal question. It's a yes, a no I know someone said, can I get back to you on that? You can. But the longer that you put it off, the more you wish you wouldn't have. I remember my brother saying, I wish I wouldn't have wasted the years on foolishness, on alcohol, parties, drugs, and doing my own thing. I wish I would have captured those years because I'd be so much further along in my journey than I am. Hmm? Prayer response team members are coming at this time, and I'm going to ask us all to stand this morning. There's going to be elders that are here, and prayer response team members are here. They're here to pray with you about whatever you want prayer with. If there's something in your life you want, you want prayer for, that maybe there's a healing. We've seen some incredible healings that have happened. Someone came up for provision one week in, and they called us that very week and said, you're not going to believe this, but God provided just as we agreed. I mean, that's the goodness of God, right? If you're here this morning and you've never accepted Jesus in your life, on your journey, can I just encourage you that today's your day? Don't put it off. Don't put it off. God wants you in your journey today. He wants you in your journey today. He wants to be in your life's journey. But he won't, he won't just barge into your life. He says, you have to accept me. You've got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and then you'll be saved. That means that you'll open up your heart to him in your journey. The Bible says that he takes your faults, your failures, your sin, all the mess 
in your life and he does something creative with it and he forgives you and he starts with a new, a new life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today that we've come to this place to receive from you. Holy Spirit, today we leave this place a little bit closer to our purpose. Some of those are already in their purpose. Some of them are way into their purpose. Others are just discovering their purpose. But God, all of us can leave today knowing more than what we did when we came in. And we can appropriate and apply what you've done for us. We can tell our stories to the world that's around us. We can be your ministers to the world that we're going to go out to in just a, in just a few moments. To the people that we live with, the people that are in our neighborhoods, the people that we go to university or school with, the people that we do life with, the people we work with. God, we can be your hands extended to a world that needs the love of Jesus Christ in their life. And I thank you that you're working out everyone's purpose because you're the great, you're the great potter and we're your clay. Now we thank you, Father, today that you bless us on our coming in. You're blessing us on our going out and our lying down and our rising up. Everything we put our hands to, I thank this week, it is blessed. And we're going to remember that we're loved, we're accepted, we belong, and that you have a purpose for our lives. And everybody said, amen, amen. God bless your week. Have a fantastic week. We'll see you next Sunday.